So, uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce these gentlemen who were with me this evening, and then I'd like to tell you the name of tonight's uh, fireside chat, because a lot of thought goes into naming these sessions, and I think this one in particular has a lot. We could contemplate just the name of this session for a long time, and, and that's exactly what we're going to be doing. But um, I'm sure that uh, all of you know um, both Arthur and Richard, but um, beside me is Arthur Zients, a professor of physics and interdisciplinary studies at Amherst University. He directs an uh, academic program of Center for Contemplative Mind. And there's a list of things that Arthur studies, but um, I wrote down these ones, the relationship between science, humanities, and meditation. It's an interesting combination, and we'll get to that. And uh, Richard Brown is next to him, founding, he, he founded the Contemplative Education Department at Naropa University. How many of you have heard about, had heard about Naropa before coming here? Okay, so most people. What well, about half of you? I hadn't. And former elementary school teacher with public school and then taught for seven years in a K-12 um, school in a Buddhist-inspired school. So um, you come to us uh, at this comp come to this conversation with a lot of different experience in teaching people of all different ages and teaching people to teach people of all different kinds of ages. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> so the name of this session is Exploration of Ways in Which Contemplative Practice Can Help Transform Teacher Education, Bring Vitality, Focus, and Passion to the Work of Education. And so with that, topic in mind, I would like to ask each of you which parts of you, or I guess the question is, what brings you to this conversation? How did you get here? What's a nice guy like you doing in a place like this? Well, <laughs> I'm here to be with you. I mean, you know, <laughs> and there's a fire? There's a fire. <laughs> Last time I saw one of these was in a Dutch restaurant where there were like 10 of them in big plasma screens, you know, warming the whole space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And plus, I've been without power for the last week. And so this is very heartwarming. This is... <laughs> um, I'd say that what, what brought me here was, at 20, a kind of despair at uh, my education. Uh, I had been a good student in high school. I went off to university. I was going to be a physicist. You know, I, was, I had the kind of vision that if you studied calculus and you did the hard stuff, that truth and wisdom would somehow open up in front of you and that, mm. that, that, that would be the, uh, the way to the great mysteries of the universe. I mean, I think that was implicit. It wasn't so explicit. By the time I was a junior and doing calculus and the hard stuff, it wasn't opening up the wisdom of the universe. It was just getting more complicated and seemingly less uh, meaningful. And uh, so I did a strange thing. I decided to flunk out. Yeah. I didn't decide to leave, oddly. Yeah. I decided to fail. And, uh, and so I was doing a pretty good job of it that semester. <laughs> and then I had the strange intuition that there was this elderly physics professor who had been teaching Lagrangian dynamics. And uh, he was a Dutchman. He didn't have the electronic fireplace. But he was a, a really wonderful, interesting old guy. And uh, so I went and, and basically collapsed in his office. And we talked about science, but we also talked about life, and it turned out he was a longtime practitioner. Oh. And so it was through him at about age 20, 21, that I began to practice. And so that's how I got here. I went back and kept studying physics. I did better that next semester, and went from a D in his course to an A, and, uh, and the D was a gift. Um, and then decided to go on and get a PhD. So since I was 20, the, the twin questions of, all right, science and contemplative practice or contemplative spirituality and meditation in particular, you know, how do these two connect? And so this theme of knowledge, of wisdom, of knowing, uh, but knowing in a way which is not just empty of meaning, because I'd gone through that. 
but somehow a knowing which was filled with, uh, with meaning and purpose and that connected to life. You talk about mm. vital mm. passion, mm. focus. I mean, those are the qualities, it seems to me, of a contemplative kind of knowing. And uh, that contemplative knowing has been important for me personally, but I think it's, especially as educators, a way of deepening, widening, reanimating, giving vitality to the material that we are trying to convey to our students. And, and we do so by being attentive and vital in that knowing ourselves. And it feels to me that meditation is a key, a real important key to that. Was it like a, a switch flipping for you when you met this interesting old Dutch guy and began doing this uh, work? Or did it take time? It was a switch. Hmm. I mean, <laughs> he's, you know, he, he, we talked, he listened, and then he told me a, a fairy tale. Will you believe this? This guy who's 65 years old and looks like, you know, a, looks like a physicist. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, shall I tell you the fairy tale? I think so. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, it, uh, it's a little story. He said, uh, you know, there was once a child who refused to comb his hair. And his mother kept saying, Johnny, you know, comb your hair, comb your hair. And he said, I don't want to. She would go after him and he would run away. And so she, at a certain point she gave up on it and the hair would get longer and more and more matted and, and it was unwashed and unkept. And uh, leaves got in it. No, I don't want it. And then finally a bird made a nest in his hair. And, uh, and then he didn't like that, you know. <laughs> it was this bird kept flying around laying eggs and stuff and then... Um, I really now, hope this is going somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> And then she said, uh, well, there's nothing for it but to cut it all off. And so she cut it all off, and she cried the whole time. And then she said, I give you a comb, and every day you comb your hair. Mm. Now, this may seem strange, but as a 20-something-year-old, 20, 21-year-old, 20, I was like near tears, mm. because uh, that was the state of my inner life. I that. It was uh, a mess. <laughs> And there's nothing for it but to start fresh. And uh, he gave me a diary, you know, one of these little appointment booklets, which was like, comb your hair, Arthur. <laughs> and that was, that was actually a switch that began then a conversation of practice, which is what you, you know, you're not combing your, your hair, but you're cultivating your inner life with the same kind of regularity, hygiene that you can be present, be all of what you have as the possibility of being through that practice. Mm. And uh, so this guy who was just doing nothing but mathematics on the board ended up, you know, helping me through a children's story. That's amazing. There's something, there are a lot of messages in there for educators, aren't there? You can hear how did, what did he do, what did you do, how did that work? And as we continue to talk, I think we'll probably have more questions about that and what we can learn from the, what you've learned from that story. And Richard, what about you? What's your, um, what was your What's journey? My story? You here? Yeah. What's your story? And, and, and I hope that there's a little, I started out I hope as there's a something physicist. got a bird in it. <laughs> 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 Not to put the pressure on, but that was a good story. <laughs> good story, hard to top there. Uh, um, I always wanted to be a teacher because it was teachers who really gave me confidence in myself and had more confidence in me than I did. And so I thought, boy, if they can do that for me, I want to do that for other people. And uh, mm -hmm. so after I got out of college, I started working in a, a mental health clinic, um, working with uh, emotionally disabled students. And we recreated a school situation for them and they brought their work in and we created an environment where they could have success and it was terrific partly because we had small groups and we were able to work very closely one-on-one -on -one or so forth and i thought well it's time for me to grow up and go into public education so uh, i got my teaching certificate and uh, 
started teaching in, a, in the Boulder Valley school system in a suburb of Boulder. And uh, it was a disaster. It really was. I, I was not prepared for all the dimensions of what was going on in that world and what was not going on in this world to meet that. And uh, so I hightailed it out of there after a couple of years. And since I was in Boulder, that was just about the time that Naropa University was starting up. And so I mm -hmm. got connected with that. And at first I thought, so oh, it's a strange Tibetan Buddhist stuff. I'm used to Zen, you know, let's keep it simple. But uh, my brother moved to Boulder at the same time. He started practicing and I realized, oh, you know, he's just becoming more of who he was when I knew him as a boy. So I thought I can do this. So went to Naropa, graduate psych program, closest thing to education. And it was amazing. That was just at the time when Trumper Rinpoche, who founded Naropa, was bringing out the Shambhala teachings, which were all about, rather than having a monastic approach to Tibetan Buddhism, it becomes a householder approach. And that was just at the time when the schools were starting up. Alia Preschool started, and then the Vidya School started, which were, was where I ended up working for seven years, after, right after I got out of Naropa. And we sort of were fumbling through trying to do the best we could with these new teachings about how, to, how Buddhist practice lived in the lives of everyday people, not as a religious practice, but as a sacred world practice. And, uh, you know, we didn't know what we were doing, but we did the best we could, and he was involved, and lots of people were involved, and the whole supportive atmosphere just it was amazing. So Vidya closed, and I thought there was something here that is really, really important that needs to continue. So I was invited to uh, come to Naropa and begin to develop uh, an education program. And so that's what happened there, and it was this inspiration about what was happening in the school with the students and the teachers. It felt like we were really on a journey together. And so then off we go, off we go. We're still going. <laughs> so that was 1990, and we've been talking over the last, how many days have we been here? Five days. <laughs> No, sorry, one day. <laughs> We've been together for a long time about mindfulness and education and how it's really, I think, a lot more people know what it is now. Um, at that time, what was happening in terms of the idea of bringing mindfulness into, say, elementary schools? Well, we really weren't using the term mindfulness mm. in those days. Um, there was the sense in those days that the teachers practice their own personal meditative practices somehow carried over into their relationships with their students. And to a large part, it did. We were blessed with having a school where lots of Buddhist families were involved so that there was that connection between home and school. And, uh, but, you know, as I said, we didn't, we were making up programs and approaches as we were going along. And yet through all that, there was this really strong sense that the relationship between the teacher and the student was the, the primary thing. And that's really where, where we started when we were developing the programs at Naropa was first you need to sort of understand who you are as a teacher, you know, what's going on in this moment with you, and be able to honor that, but not have it get in the way of your relationship with the student. And then from there, magic happens. And it was that way. I find myself creating 
things that I never would have dreamed of because of that kind of climate of trust, openness, and fresh encounter. So I'm, I'm seeing you. Yeah, you know, the, this experience of, uh, you know, as I, as you probably imagine, can imagine, most of the teaching that I do is teaching with young adults, 18 to 22 year olds at Amherst College, undergraduates, uh, and in all kinds of classes, physics classes, interdisciplinary classes. But my wife and I also started the Hartsbrook Waldorf School, a Waldorf School, which I think works in a very similar kind of way, that the primary contemplative practices are practices for the teacher. And uh, you work not only on yourself, but also by working uh, inwardly with the children that you have in your class. And uh, you carry them uh, not only in your intellect, intellectual sort of consciousness and emotional consciousness, but also in your contemplative consciousness. And, and what one finds is that you know, by holding the, their situation, their issues, problems, destiny, whatever it may be, uh, learning difficulties, uh, that not necessarily in the moment of the con contemplation and the meditation, but actually in the class, live, you know, you've been living their lives uh, and your responsibilities towards them and your affection towards them, your, you know, your, you could say your love, love of your class. And then that gives the opportunity for something to begin to emerge. You know, I think this is a whole, whole uh, kind of discovery moment you know, that, that I think in contemplative practice is, is uh, really at its core uh, can be about. That is to say, this process of contemplative knowing, contemplative inquiry, contemplative uh, holding of the issues that are before you. And so through the uh, work that my wife and I did with teachers and, and children in building up that school, we really had an opportunity to see that, that in action. And now you have a, a whole other gesture, which is to say, how can we find appropriate ways of uh, bringing contemplative practice directly mm -hmm. into the classroom? not just for the teachers, but also at various ages for the, for the children in ways that make good sense. And I think that's a very exciting, but a big responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we do that properly? And if we do that properly, it'll be a great benefit. And, and we're gonna get to some examples of that, but, but just you talking about, because we have talked um, over the last while about that person themselves being contemplative, the teacher, the adult and that that has an impact uh, on the child. And I think that's what I'm hearing uh, both of you say. But I've never heard anybody be very explicit about that. So what does that look like to you? What is a contemplative teacher, one who's not actually applying it on and with the children, but just being that person? Um, that's not applying it to They're the... not uh, saying to the kids... Uh, sit sit breathe, this way breathe, and breathe this breathe. way. They are the... They, are, they have a practice. The teacher themselves, they are coming mindfully to those children. What does that look like? Do you want to start? Sure. Well, I think you're always in relationship. You know, even if you're doing nothing, your presence, your physical presence is communicating. Your emotional presence is communicating. So I think when the teacher is aware of that dynamic and has done enough work to be able to notice what they're experiencing at the time. You know, maybe they're feeling a little anxious about presenting this lesson, you know. Rather than trying to mask that mm. and forge ahead, you don't have to indulge in it and say, oh God, I don't know what I'm gonna do today, you know. But there's a, there's a middle ground where there's a kind of vulnerability there. And maybe you don't say anything at all about it but your presence is authentic in that moment because your inner life is being reflected in your open presence. There's a kind of vulnerability there which also has a kind of confidence, you know? And it's a confidence that I'm not exactly sure what I'm gonna do with this lesson plan, but I know it's going to unfold because we're in relationship. Mm. And I have enough skills to be able to work with, in a sense, whatever arises, you know, because I don't have to fight it. I don't have to give in to it. I can actually meet it. And, and that journey can be beneficial to me and to the students. We might reshape the lesson plan 
based on the response I get from the students. Um, I might actually strengthen my position and say, no, we're really going to do this now. You know? So you have options when that openness is there and the confidence to engage at the same time. You know, there's a, this theme of relationship, I think, is so important. Um, normally, relationships are secondary. I'm here, you're there, and there is a relationship. But basically, it's me and you, right, like that. But if you just, you know, just turn to the person next to you and uh, look at them, all right? Just, you know, there they are. Maybe you hadn't noticed before, <laughs> there they are. <laughs> but now I'd like you to, to shift your awareness, and this is we're not going to do a big thing, but just, just shift your awareness from yourself looking at them to the sensing, sensing the space that is between you. Just shift your awareness from the them, from them to the space that is between you. And get just a little bit quiet. And begin, to, if you can, to feel the quality of the space that is between you. And if you were to intensify that experience, you know, deepen it, you know, what's, what are some of the words that start to come up for you, some of the, the images that come up for you as you are conscious, not just of this person across from you, but of the relationship, the space between you? Yeah? Okay. And can you feel as you turn away, you're turning away from something? You know, there, was, there was actually something that began to instantiate between you? that was not visible, but was palpable. Sometimes it's called the social field, interbeing by Thich Nhat Hanh. I know ma is the Japanese term for the space between a, a sanctuary and a place of worship. You know, there are two buildings, and they, they look at each other, they face one another. And in some way, I think at, by the end of that, you want to bow and say thank you, you know, not just to the person across from you, but to the space that is between you. And uh, how, how is that, it's, it's almost like when teaching becomes an art, then you, you lift that space between yourself and those that are in your care into that kind of quality of, uh, of reality. The space becomes more real, you know. The relationships become so, so powerful and so real. We, we don't take relationships seriously. When we speak about holism, I think that's what we're trying to reach for. We're trying to reach for the reality of relationship. All right? It's not secondary, superimposed on objects, but the whole, the whole human being, the whole class, our interconnectedness becomes whew, powerful. So you know, that, that's one aspect of it. And how many, let me just say this, um, you know, how many of you feel when you've been with a great teacher, it wasn't what they said, it was who they were? Mm. You know, right? <laughs> yeah, everybody, right? You know, it's, they could just stand up in the classroom and you go, yes. <laughs> mm. um, not because they were a big ego, not because they were big showmen, who they were. Mm. You forgot everything they said. But you didn't forget them. This, this notion of relationship, I think, also extends beyond the relationship between teachers and students and among students, uh, especially because we're talking about education here. It's also the relationship to the subject, the relationship to the materials that you're working with. Mm -hmm. When you have that same kind of relationship that was just described, toward what it is that you're learning. I'm sure that many of us who are older got that same kind of reverence passed along to us by our parents or grandparents when we held a good book in our hand, a fine, well-crafted, beautifully written book. You approached it in a different way. Uh, you approached it with that kind of 
respect and almost devotion. So there was a, a natural sacred relationship there. And I think that we've lost that in a sense. So I think part of teacher education is not only to restore that human relationship, but also to restore the relationship with what it is that we're engaged in in the material world, if you will, and in the realm of ideas and skills and so forth. Um, in our program at Naropa, our master's program, uh, the students learn to use the brush and practice very simple brush strokes. And they work with a master teacher who comes in and instructs our students in reverence for the brush, how to hold the brush, how to look at the brush, how to feel the weight of the brush, how to notice when that brush is touching the ink and the ink-filled brush, what it feels like when it's on the paper. And this isn't just some sort of esoteric exercise. Uh, this just this last week in one of my online classes, one of my students reported, you know, I was doing my brush stroke practice and then I had to write something with a pen using handwriting. And I realized that it was, I didn't have the same connection between the pen and paper that I do between the brush and the paper. And I started just paying attention to the pen on the paper in the same kind of way that I did with the brush. And it totally changed the way I was writing. Mm. And it became a meaningful experience rather than an automatic experience. So these students are students who signed up to become teachers? They are teachers. They are already teachers. And they did they know that they were going to be painting? Like, well, how do they respond to this? Because I think you mentioned earlier that some of these people are, are young students and they come expecting one kind of teacher training and then suddenly they're doing something very different. How, did, how does that work? Well, um, I think most of the students who come to our master's program have some vague idea of what they're getting into and they Don't realize <laughs> that, uh, that aesthetic practice is part of that. But so let's I'd, go then to the first year students all right, that you work so with. I do teach first year students at Naropa, entering freshmen or first years as they're called now, uh, who have some general idea about contemplative education at Naropa but really don't know what that is. Or maybe they're long-term practitioners even though they're young and they have a very strong idea about what Buddhism is but they don't have any idea what that's like when you put it in a, a learning context. You know, where it's not about learning the Dharma, it's about you know, studying a text. And uh, so there's a huge range of experience. We were talking about this earlier. With undergraduates these days, it's just a huge range. And people even coming into Naropa, this is a contemplative university, a lot of times we all have our own fixed ideas of what things are going to be like. I'm sure we all had them coming here uh, this weekend. And it's never the same. So, you know, meeting that and having a certain amount of confidence because I think one of the values, if you will, of contemplative approaches is that they're based in wisdom traditions which do have lineage. There is experience, sometimes thousands of years of experience that we're drawing upon. So we can have a certain amount of confidence that the basis of what we're doing has been tried out and has worked for certain people. Now, obviously, we're making changes. We're adapting this to the, to the modern academic world. So there's always this sense of risk taking. And you know, I myself, for many, many years, and still am very, very cautious about perverting the Dharma, you know, of taking the teachings of the Buddha and sort of popularizing them or making them too accessible. And mm -hmm. so there's always this tension there, uh, which is, uh, you know, I, I think an important tension that we don't just 
because we think it's so fantastic, adapt it in ways that uh, may be questionable. And that's what I love about Garrison is that we have a chance to talk about these kinds of issues. You know, we've got people from all different kinds of programs here and we can talk about how we're doing these things and sort of bounce up against each other. You know, I tend to go very slowly, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> some people go a lot quicker in developing these things. Arthur, how do you think people, uh, because there are people here, some who have probably had uh, practices for many years and um, others who, who don't. So how do you become a contemplative teacher? Do you have to, do you have to take up a practice yourself and become? Um, you know, we, we've, we've had a lot of experience. So the Center for Contemplative Mind and Society, which now focuses its attention on academic program, which is to say college, university, junior college teachers, and also increasingly also secondary school teachers. So we've worked with many hundreds, I'd say now actually a couple thousand people who are in that category. Um, our experience is if you have a practice, not everybody does have a, a serious practice, but if you have a practice, it is a great benefit. It's not, I think, required, but you know, it's, it's always better to have experience with what you're teaching. It's, you know, if you're going to teach physics, it's good to have worked through the problem set beforehand. Um, you know, whenever I teach a practice, I teach it having tried it myself for a while. Um, so I think that's, that's a benefit. But it's also not the case that you need to be the Buddha or the Bodhisattva or some, you know, master. You know, we are, we're all just where we are and we can teach what we know and it needn't be a lot. You know, I sometimes get thrown into these interdisciplinary courses and I've taught, uh, I've taught what Keats is owed to a Grecian urn. I had barely read the thing, you know, and, and they said, well, that's all right, it's a first year class, go in and, you know. And they, I, get the five minute, I get the five minute primer, but I can ask questions, yeah. Yeah. you know, I can ask questions. It won't be the same as if Robert Frost were teaching it, but um, he was a teacher at Amherst College also. Um, but, but nonetheless, that's, you know, that's the case. Uh, you know, I've, I've also, really appreciate this, 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 uh, this question of working with adolescents, let's say high school aged young people, and especially in my case now college aged. You know, there's a wide range of practices which you can introduce. Let me just give a kind of, for me there are, there are sort of three classes of practice. One is, I think of them as hygienic practices, practices which cultivate attention, stillness, emotional balance, which are simply good things in life. And, uh, like when I'm working with pre-med students, right? So you got a class like this size with people who are desperate to get into medical school. I mean, they are like, you know, chomping at the bit and they're worried about every grade point. And I flash up two studies on uh, MBSR, basically studies, mindfulness-based stress reduction for medical students. And it says, you know, we can help you. <laughs> And I, and I say, you know, you're going to forget every one of the equations that you've uh, learned with me, you know. But if I can teach you this, it will help you for your rest of your life, certainly through medical school. And so I say, uh, will you, would you like to join me? It's voluntary. You're adults. You don't have to. And I describe what I'm going to do. I gave them the rationale. I think it's important for young adults to give a rationale, to say why you're doing something. It's and not teenagers just- teenagers as well. Teenagers as well. I think they, they deserve our respect and, and, and a rationale for why we're doing it. And then introduce the practice ahead of time so they know what they're getting into. Don't just say, follow me, but say, this is what we're going to be doing so they can make a choice. And then you do the practice. And the, my experience is, first of all, about half of them have already been doing some kind of a practice and they all join in. The first time I remember doing that, um, I dimmed the lights a little bit because they were just like this, you know, you're always under these big lights. And I went to turn the lights back on and as I was walking over, I could feel how the room had settled. Mm -hmm. And I just turned back and I said, do you feel that? And there was this, yes. Mm -hmm. And you flip the lights up back to full and you start with a very different gesture. So you got the pre-med students with the hygiene. That's primarily the, the, the work there. Then you're teaching a first year seminar on eros and insight, on love and knowledge. And there, every week, there's a different exercise. We do go fast. Um, uh, 
there's a, there's a stillness exercise, there's an attention exercise, there's a perceiving relationship exercise, there's a sustaining contradiction exercise or two, there's a loving kindness exercise, and so on. And they are keyed to the readings that we bring in, to the texts, so that those exercises are in relationship to what it is that we're actually going through. So they are, they are very course dependent and content dependent. So I think there are certain hygienic exercises and then there are others that are working really closely with content. Mm. And then I think these, these practices which connect us back into the world are important. The social, you might say, the ones that have a social dimension, like the loving kindness practices, where one really takes up another person in consciousness and carries that person in a particular way and there are various ways of doing that. Um, now, as you can see, because there is a wide range of practices of these sorts, the more you've done practice yourself, the more fluent you are in, able, in, in being able to match the practices to the course content. Um, so there, I think there are a set of relatively simple basic practices which have huge value, but if you, if you can do it, if you can do more, then this whole theme, which has been a theme in my life, of how does one know at the hand of these practices? Right, then that begins to open up and give itself, give itself to you. Um, just to give a, not, not specific practices, but a kind of set of classes of practice. And uh, my experience is students, you know, people say, well, do college students, smart college students, go for this. Um, most of them go immediately. They're perfectly open. Some of them are a little skeptical. But the, the interesting thing is, if they give it a little time, it's its own validation. I always think, you know, I'm always nervous, even after 40 years of practice of my own and, and you know, 15 or 20 years of practicing with students, and I'm still a little nervous. But then I think, hey, listen, this works. <laughs> I mean, you know, you don't have to prove it. Just, have, just get them to sit a little bit. Yeah. One guy wrote a paper. We always have them. They write little papers afterwards. And he said, I was very skeptical. He was a science type. I was very skeptical. But I was out running one day out in the woods, you know, in the forest. We have a wonderful field. I said, I'm going to try this. He said, so I sat down, my back against the tree. I closed my eyes. I got still. And he said, I've had an experience like I never have had before in my life. Something real was going on. I didn't know what it was, but I knew it was real. And uh, that, to me, is the truth of the practice. You don't have to believe in God. You don't have to believe in anything. It's just the authenticity of doing the work. And uh, it's not to say every time you sit, that happens. But it's there. That's interesting, because a lot of people who are here do teach at the high school level and at the college level and in prisons and in healthcare systems. So that's interesting for me, that adult, engaging the adult learner and what's in it for them. The people you're working with, which some of the students are going back now and creating uh, curriculum, and there, there's, so there's a kind of a, a pedagogy around this. Right. Yeah. And uh, let me just mention one uh, that we use in our program, which is a form of debate. Which, you know, in ancient times in India, the the there was debate was a way of convincing others. And uh, also sharpening your own <laughs> reasoning. I didn't get the ability. memo, I guess. You didn't get the memo? <laughs> That's what you see. Yeah. So um, one of the things that, that I think is important when we're talking about contemplative education and contemplative pedagogy mm -hmm. is that we're also working in the realm of ideas. It's not like you, you have a good relationship and then you sort of mm, get down to work do again. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're thinking and communicating about ideas in the same old way. Uh, we're, in our program, very interested in working with our concepts in a contemplative fashion. So that, uh, and, and one of the ways we do this is through debate, which some of our students have taken back to their high schools and used this. And let me just briefly describe this uh, approach, it is that, and we use this in our summer programs, and our summer programs really stress uh, the sense of learning community and developing those trusting relationships so that our students get a real sense of what it's like 
to be in a challenging but non-competitive learning environment. And then we're able to do this debate. Uh, and we, what we do is we focus on community issues. For example, um, maybe, you know, something mild like there are too many salads at lunch. You know, we, we all eat together and all this. We 12 hours a day together for 21 days. So it's very intensive. But, you know, there may be more potent issues like, you know, we really need a day off or we're not studying this well enough or so forth. So what we do is we come up with these real community issues and then two students will debate. And what they do is they prepare ahead of time by sharing with each other what their various positions are and what they're going to be discussing generally. Um, and the, the instructions are to really stay with your position. So, in a sense, you have to have a fixed mind, you know. <laughs> you can't just say, oh, you're, having, you're making such a good argument, I just completely give in, you know. <laughs> you have to stay with yours. But on the other hand, the practice is to actually listen to the other mm. person. So often, when we're having a debate, we're, our mind is working to try to figure out how to counter that person, you know. We're coming up with our next argument. So in order to break that, what we do is we have one person present their position, their statement, opening statement, and then they ring the gong. And you wait until the sound is dissipated, and then you respond. Mm. So that it creates that time, that gap, mm. so that I can actually, you could actually listen to what I said, take it in, Realize that you need to come up with a counterpoint, but you're also listening to what I said. So there's this merging of mm. what's offered and what your position is, which makes for very creative thinking. Mm. Uh, the students are almost always surprised by where they get by the end of the debate because they still have their different positions. But it's almost like a creative process happens rather than a confrontational process. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, how to, how to take the aggression out of exchange, how to take the sense of I won and you lost, but how can we explore this question thoroughly? Mm -hmm. So that's one example that's been taken back by some of our students to their high schools and in introducing this new approach to uh, debate. And how did it go there? Great. Uh, one of our students uh, wrote her uh, master's thesis on, on the scholars debate, she called it. She teacher in South Carolina. Uh -huh. We have about 10 minutes for questions. And so um, we'll, we're happy to carry on talking about this and getting more examples. But we'd love to take uh, a few questions. Oh, here we go. Hi. Yeah, I'd kind of like to know what we can do to change teacher education programs to have the kinds of teachers in the classrooms that we want. What are your suggestions? Um, you know, this is a wonderful, wonderful issue. In fact, that uh, Tish Jennings and, and um, uh, the Garrison Institute and the Center for Contemplative Mind have, have a joint project to just raise this, the, precisely this kind of question, to look at the, uh, the, the work that's already been going on for a while within certain, certain teacher training programs and to uh, lift up the things that have been working best, um, and then to convene a larger meeting where this would be actually the, one of the fo focuses for, for our work. There's also a project with, in Israel, and I think I saw Tobin and Rona here. Uh, they were recently uh, in Israel working with the Teach for Israel uh, group uh, with just this question, what can we bring, bring to them? Um, you know, you've got a whole contemplative teacher training program, yeah, right? So there's a, there's a whole program in for teachers which brings the contemplative in. Um, so this is, this is like a major theme. I don't know whether we, we want to like get too specific. Do you want to? Well, uh, I think it's starting to permeate, you know? I think it's starting to permeate, uh, you know, next week I'm going to be up at the University of Colorado talking to their school of education about contemplative teacher education and, uh, you know, uh, one of uh, Pamela's colleagues, Dan Liston, 
is connected with the Courage to Teacher Lead program. So, you know, changes are starting to happen on that personal level, I think, and yeah. eventually <laughs> there will be change, but, you know, you know, these institutions move very slowly. You know, again, to me, there, there's, there's like two communities you're talking about in teacher training. There's the community of teachers themselves, right? But then they are going to be working with children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there is, you could ask yourself, what are the practices that bring about within the teacher the qualities and, and the, you might say, the pedagogical uh, understandings and practices which uh, flourish at the hand of contemplative practices? What are the practices which support the teacher? And then you can ask, are there either gentle or, or implicit practices at particular ages that are age appropriate that can be developed for use in the classroom? So you've got, in some ways, two communities. And both of them could be taught in the teacher training process. Then there are, uh, to me, like, for example, issues that will come up in the classroom, problems that arise in the classroom. Uh, that don't have an easy kind of textbook solution. How do you carry those kinds of issues contemplatively through a, what I call a contemplative inquiry process so that you not only bring your rational mind, but you also bring your reflective and contemplative mind to work on those kinds of issues? And I've, I, I'd say, for example, I've worked with a, a group of teacher trainers up in Finland on this, and. Uh, we talked and designed some processes for them where then you go off to your practicum, you actually try out some of these practices. How do they benefit me? How do they work in the classroom? Am I able to take a particular issue or problem and basically work with contemplative inquiry through that? I journal that. I bring it back to my instructors. We talk about it in a class. I mean, this is it's a wonderful, to me, these would be the kind of wonderful uh, examples of certain practices for yourself, certain practices for the child, certain practices that allow you to engage problems in ways you haven't thought of before, and to build that into the curriculum you know, in a way that really makes sense and is coherent. And as you say, I think there's a readiness. It's starting to happen in an almost natural way. Um, but this is, this, I, this is a task. You know? It's mm. not like we have all the answers. They, they, 2,500 years ago was different than today. And uh, so we need to benefit by the wisdom traditions and then take full responsibility for it uh, as a research and development kind of task. And there are people who are out in the field, and some of them are here, uh, that could partner with us. You know, it's, it is such a wonderful question and uh, deserves a really full answer. Um, let me just say, I'll invite you all next weekend at Amherst College, especially those of you in secondary education or tertiary education, uh, there's, a, there's a conference on, on the Contemplative Academy at Amherst College. There'll be 50 papers and another dozen or so posters by people who are in the classroom basically telling what's working for them. So if you, if you want to go to a place where there's not just a couple of guys up here by a fireplace, you know, trying to make sense of the universe. The fireplace died after nine minutes. Yeah, well, there you go. Um, but if you want to hear from 50 colleagues, I mean, you can't listen to all of, all of them, but you know, if, if you want to hear from mm. people like yourself who are basically a few years ahead and have tr started trying things, come. And then in two weeks, that is to say the week after next, we'll be back here, that same community, the Center for Contemplative Mind, will be here for a retreat with educators. I mean, this is where you actually, if you're trying to develop a practice of your own and you're wondering, how do I get started? We'll come on a Thursday evening spend three days, half of it in silence with us, only with, with educators. Uh, so you're all, you're all most welcome and invited. Uh, I mean, that's, that's also a practical way of getting on the ground kind of lived experience by people who have been trying this out for, for some years. And of course, there'll be keynoters and other things going on. But I think in some ways, the community of discourse is one of the most exciting things that you know, if you go back and, and over the next two or three years you start trying certain things and something starts to click for you, then you need to be able to share it. So to bring people together around that and to basically have 10 or 20 people in a room listening to what it is, trying it out, learning the technique, then you can go back. Do you want to tell us about another one, Richard? You've told us about the one, which is the debate. Is there another example of something that one of your students has uh, done? Well, uh, let's see, maybe a short one. You know, the, the, there's one thing to 
do practices in the class. It's another to take what you're already teaching and modify it. Uh, I just, a couple of weeks ago, another student who's in the second year um, has been teaching about uh, Greek philosophers for a long time. And recently, through our program, he got interested in the contemplative dimensions of Greek philosophy and has started identifying particular Greeks who seem to have very contemplative perspective. So he's shifting his whole class in order to be able to focus on that. Mm. And uh, so he's then being able to bring in uh, contemplative practices because that's what they're studying, right? So it fits into the, into the curriculum. And you know, just to add another story from another student who was teaching uh, about uh, a lesson on, on the book Siddhartha. And so he is have, it's a two week session and he has his students uh, meditate because for obvious reasons. So they would start the class with the period of meditation and he wrote and he said, hey, it was Monday morning, I had a rough weekend, I came in and I just didn't feel like pushing the meditation thing and it, you know, there had been kind of lackluster response to it. And I just thought, oh, let's just let it go. And then out of the corner of the room, one said, aren't we going to meditate today? <laughs> you know? Another one said, yeah, let's do it. And so he just plopped down and said, so much for my preconceptions, you know. And so we can't always judge the effect of things by the expression of the adolescents in the classroom. <laughs> and and, uh, and the, the places where this happens can be very unusual. You know, across the river, there's, an, there's a little university. <laughs> do, you, do you know what the university is? West Point. Yeah, Marilyn Nelson, uh, Poet Laureate of Connecticut and a contemplative practitioner, uh, became a contemplative practice fellow of the center. The center has 153 contemplative practice fellows that over the years we've awarded. And she was just gotten this award from the, from, the, uh, from the center and also from the American Council of Learned Societies with whom we were partnering. And then she got an invitation from Colonel So-and-so, who was the head of the uh, education at, the, uh, at West Point, to come and teach there. And this is a wonderful African-American woman who's been teaching at Stores, Connecticut, and the University of Connecticut, and a great poet. She wanted to do this. But she then turned to him and said, you know, I've just gotten this award which uh, allows me or requires me to teach poetry through contemplative practice. And he said, well, okay. <laughs> and so she taught for a semester across the river here hmm. to a group of young cadets. Wow. And on the last day of class, she told the same story. She, she said, I was rushing and I said, we're not gonna meditate today. And they said, no, we, we have to meditate. And she said, no. We're not going to meditate today. I've got too much. She turned around, to the, went to the board, and when she turned back to them, there were a bunch of them missing. And she said, we, you know, where's so-and-so and so-and-so? And everybody giggled, and they, and they kind of peeked under the table, and there they were doing their meditation <laughs> under, under the classroom wow. table. To this day, you know, she gets letters from them, whether they're in Afghanistan or Iraq, wow. wherever they are. And here's the trick. If you're trying to meditate in combat zone, with a bunch of guys in your you know, squadron, what you do is you put on headphones and you take your iPod and put nothing in it. And then you can turn it on and people don't bother you. They leave you in peace. And you can do your practice. That's a good tip for us to leave on, I think. If we're ever in a war zone and we want to meditate, <laughs> that's what we will do our <laughs> Now, there, was a, there was an interest in ending with a very short practice. Do we have a few minutes for, for doing let's, that? Let's end with that, yes. All right. Uh, the practice I'd like to suggest is a variation on loving kindness. Many of you will know loving kindness practice is a, is a practice, uh, a very beautiful practice, where one takes uh, a set of individuals and brings a certain gesture of loving kindness towards them with a, typically a, a, a set of words which are spoken silently, which are, which are uh, wishing that person health, peace, joy, well-being. It can vary according to your sensibilities. But what I'd like to suggest is that as teachers, each one of us also 
could take up children in our classes. And typically, the, the loving kindness practice works with, uh, for example, three different kinds of person. A person that's very well known to you and much loved and cared for. A person who's a kind of neutral person who you don't really know very well, don't have a feeling one way or the other about, and then a difficult person. But what I'm going to ask you to do is rather than pick you know, your favorite teacher or grandparent or something of that kind, I'm going to ask you to, to pick three children. Uh, children who uh, perhaps the first one would be then a child who is your favorite. You know, this is the child of your dreams, right? That's been in your class. So pick, pick the child that is that, uh, that special, especially gifted child for you. Then there's there are probably a, some children who you feel a little distant from. You don't know them very well. And then there's the one that annoys you. You know, there's the one that's always the difficult tough one. And we're going to work with each of those three in the following way. We're going to establish a certain quiet inwardly. And then we're going to imagine the first child, the child with whom we have a great and, and easy relationship. And then we're going to extend to them our, our loving kindness, give that as an offering and wish them well. And you can choose your own words that may seem appropriate to that child. You may wish them flourishing in their lives, joy, equanimity, that they're able to meet the challenges before them. And then we'll do the same for each of the other two. So I invite you to take a posture which to you supports your practice. Your eyes can be open or closed. If open, then one recommends normally to look at the rug or the back of the chair in front of you with your eyes half open. Take a breath or two to allow the, the body to unwind and relax with, without flagging of attention. And we're taking a step into, I always feel a step through a kind of doorway, a doorway which is the doorway of modesty, of humility, and even a certain reverence for these children who we're going to bring to mind. These are extraordinary young human beings, each one of them. So inwardly request permission. And then visualize that first student, the student who is uh, one of the easy favorite ones with whom the relationship arises and, and feel from your own heart to their being that relation. And then find words such as, may you be well. May you experience joy. May you flourish in your life. And uh, repeat those words. And having extended loving kindness towards this precious human being, turn to the second the second child who's less well known to you. And with that student before you, 
extend to them also, offer freely. that quality of heart that also wishes them joy, well-being, flourishing. And then, having extended that loving kindness to the second student, turn to the third, who is a challenge, perhaps even a great challenge for you. But they too are part of your class, part of your life now. Allow them to be fully present before you and find your way towards them. Again, finding that place from in yourself, within yourself, which can offer to them in freedom the gesture of loving kindness. And then wish them well, joy, peace, flourishing. And of course, these three are but three from out of the class So allow that same inner gesture of loving kindness to pervade not only these three, but, but extend it to all those in your care. Wishing them well, joy, flourishing, well-being, peace. I'd like to end with the words uh, actually the words of Einstein a human being is a part of a whole called by us the universe a limited part in space and time He experiences himself, his thoughts, and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few people nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. So allow that loving kindness to pervade all of nature, all living creatures, all of people in its beauty, in its depths of wisdom and good. And then I invite you to, to close the practice with gratitude. Gratitude to those with whom you work, for those in your care. Gratitude even for these minutes of practice. 
Thank you.